most people are aware of the Maya through the culture that they built over 2,000 years ago, which is uh, archaeologists have defined as their so-called classic period. It spanned from about uh, just a little bit before our year one through about 900 AD. So a thousand year period or so where um, they had many, many cities that were sprinkled all across the Yucatan Peninsula as well as down into uh, parts of uh, Central America. And these cities were, these were really vast and impressive cities that had populations that were um, equal to or greater than any of the cities that were in existence at the same time in Europe. The uh, end of the so-called classic period um, was marked by uh, a great kind of political disaster, if you will. Their, their political structure collapsed in on itself. People stopped um, believing in the divinity of the kings. There had been an extended period of drought, which had led to, um, you know, basically the political structure being unable to feed its people. So there was kind of a mass exodus from the cities, and the cities were left to the jungle for the next few thousand years. But the Maya people didn't go anywhere. They still exist. There's over six million of them in the world, and um, with most of them still living in Mesoamerica. Here's a photo of a few of my friends who I um, went uh, on a trip to Chichen Itza, so this is actually at the top of the, um, mm -hmm. it's called the Castle of Kukulkan. It's the, the pyramid that everybody knows about whenever anyone talks about the Maya, they show that pyramid. So that's kind of the first misconception to, uh, to dispel. When you hear about people um, talking about the Maya, they always talk about them as if they're gone, as if they disappeared, mysteriously disappeared the Maya, but they didn't, they're still here. Sometimes uh, the, the analogy I like to use is, um, it's kind of analogous to say the fall of Rome. The Roman Empire fell apart, the political structure that held that empire together disappeared, but the people didn't go anywhere. There's even still the city of Rome, and there are still Romans, but uh, it's, it's kind of an analogous situation for the Maya. <clears throat> but the thing that uh, all of the various and wonderful parts of the Maya culture, uh, the thing that has um, kind of fascinated people of late has been their calendars, and in particular, one of their calendars. And I should say that the Maya actually use several different calendars for several different reasons. Um, they have a 260-day cyclical calendar that um, is more of a uh, it's a kind of like a spiritual or um, I'm blanking on the word, but a celebratory um, calendar. Then they have a 365-day calendar, which is more like their simple calendar, if you will. But they had one calendar, which uh, everyone has kind of glommed onto, and whenever people talk about the Maya calendar, the long count calendar is the one that they are generally talking about. However, this symbol is not the Maya calendar. You'll see uh, all the time in the media, they'll talk about the Maya calendar, as if there's only one, and then they'll show this image. And right away, that means, whenever you, so this is a warning to you. When you hear someone say the Maya calendar and they show this image, you can immediately ignore anything else they have to say because they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> this is not, actually it's not even a calendar. It comes from the Aztec culture, which was hundreds of years after the classical period of the Maya, um, in a different region of Mexico, north of um, the Maya lands. It's a, it's a rather impressive stone, it's a beautiful work of art. So I will look at Lamenta's art, it was a, uh, most likely an altar. But it wasn't a calendar either. It has some calendar symbols in it. And that's probably why people have you know, called it uh, sometimes the calendar stone. But it's really referred to as the sunstone because of the big image of the sun in the center, who was one of their major deities. But uh, So that's just a warning to you. Whenever you see this symbol being used and people talk about the Maya calendar, they don't know what they're talking about. All right, so let me tell you a little bit about the long count calendar. It's kind of interesting that we call it the long count. Um, it's a calendar that 
Um, in some ways, some archaeologists say you can kind of mark the end of the classic period of the Maya by the end of the use of this calendar. So around 900 AD or so, that political structure that was using this calendar collapsed, and the calendar was never used after that point. So no one in the Maya world uses this calendar anymore. There are some, still some Maya who use the 260-day and 365-day calendars, but nobody uses this, and nobody has for over a thousand years. So we don't know what it would be called. We have, there's, there's no words in modern Maya language for this calendar, so we've given it this name, the long count, because it counts time over a long period of time. The other calendars that I mentioned are very cyclical. Every 260 days, they just repeat with the same um, day names and numbers, or every 365 days, and they run in these cycles. The long count was different from that in the sense that it was constructed more as a way to count time in a, in a more linear fashion. It may still have had some cyclical nature to it. It's not very clear, though, from any of the archaeological evidence. Here's the basic structure in, way, in the way it works. Um, it counts days, which are called kings. Most of the Maya languages, they use the same word for um, keen. I should mention that there's not one Maya language even. There's at least 30 or so still existing Maya languages spoken throughout Mesoamerica right now. Um, so you get bundles of days in 20. So every 20 days you have what they call a minal. So that's kind of like a month. Um, 20 was actually the base of their counting system, so this is kind of a nice... You know, they count up to 20, and they count things in bundles of 20s, kind of like our decimal system, right? We count things in decades or in groups of 10s, because that's easy for us, because of our counting system is based on 10. Their counting system is based on 20, so they tend to count things in bundles of 20. So you get 20 days makes a vinal, which is like a month, and then you almost get 20 vinals to make up a year, but you don't want 20, because that would be too many, so instead they go with 300, uh, they want to get close to the solar year, so they go with 360 days, which is then 18 of those months. And then they count, then they go back to the 20s. They count 20 groups of 360 day periods, that's almost like 20 years, but just a few days short of it. And then we have 20 groups of the, those are called katums, those 20 uh, year periods. And then you have 20 of those to make up what's called a baktu, which is a total of 144,000 days. Um, so we're a few hundred, close to 400 years. So that's the way the long count works. It just counts time in these groupings of dates, really, in bundles of 20. And we see monuments and some uh, existing writing of the long count date, and we see the examples of those dates, and those are dates that are written usually to record something special that's happened at that time. So for example, if you see a monument with the date on it, that basically is um, telling you the date of the dedication of that monument, in most cases. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. You just put up the Dresden Codex as an example of the long count? Yes. Is that right? And the Dresden Codex was found in Yeah, that's a, it was no longer in use. Yeah, the, the, I, I don't. I have to admit, I don't know uh, much about the, the codices. So, for those who don't know, there were um, these um, pressed bark books that actually were in use throughout Mesoamerica, but the Maya people were using it as well. Um, and most of them were burned uh, during the conquest period. Four survived, and one of them is on this page. It's called the it was called the Dresden Codex because that's where it was kind of rediscovered in, in modern times in uh, Dresden, Germany. Um, my, under my understanding is that um, there's a lot of information that had been kind of recopied and recopied and recopied generation after generation. So even though these books were actually modern, they were not from the classic period, they probably contained information that had been copied and recopied generation after generation. 
into them. So we do actually have an example of a long count date written in what was a, uh, a modern um, a modern text. Um, so this is an example of one written long of uh, the numbers here. I, I I don't want to spend too much time on their number system, although it was pretty, pretty neat. It just used dots, <coughs> bars, and shells. Those are the only symbols they used in order to represent their numbers. And it's pretty easy. A dot meant one, and a bar meant five, and a shell meant zero, or completeness. So you have 16 here, nine here, nine here, nine here. Modern scholars like to just simply write these with little periods separating the spaces. Um, of the different levels of the long count. One of the things I'll mention is that every time you see a long count, you never see the long count uh, date all by itself, but you also see it with those other two calendars I mentioned, the Sulkin and the Hab, the 260-day cycle and the 365-day cycle. So they were actually often using all of these different calendars at the same time, which might be somewhat analogous to us using, for instance, days of the week. You know, we have a calendar, the Gregorian calendar, which counts days and months and years, and then there's this seven-day cycle of weeks that runs throughout that kind of independently, but still we use it at the same time. Now, um, another, another important thing to know about the long count is that it was one of the things that um, we see over and over again in monuments is reference to the beginning of the long count. So year, year zero, if you will, year one. And interestingly enough, it's not written as all zeros. In the highest order, the Bakum, in that period of um, 144,000 years, the creation date uh, is written as 13 Bakum, and then all of the others are zeros. Although then it also gave, gives the Sulkin and the Hob dates for that creation day, which strangely enough are not the beginning of either of those cycles. Those are somewhere in the middle of the cycles for the Sulkin and the Hob. So it's really just the beginning of the long count. <coughs> now, the idea of what's uh, happening um, with the beginning of the long count is the idea is that there was this um, the legendary beginning of the world that the, that the Maya had. It was their creation myth, if you will. And uh, I won't go into the whole story. In fact, if you are interested in uh, getting a little taste of that, there's a really great planetarium show that Chabot Space and Science Center um, has running right now called Tales of the Maya Sky, and it has a nice telling of some different aspects of the uh, creation story. It's a, it's a very long story, so they highlight a couple of the key ones, especially the... Um, there were two hero twins in this time who journeyed to the underworld to um, defeat the lords of the underworld, which was called Shibaba. And they uh, then saved their father and uh, resurrected him as the corn god. And it was this, all of these uh, events were kind of happening out of time, if you will. And then once they had kind of completed their destiny, they became the sun and the moon and moved through the sky, and the first day began. Um, and the idea is that they set the beginning of the long count calendar to coincide with the beginning of time correlated to this story, which is actually kind of familiar to us because the Gregorian calendar is built on the same idea. The beginning of the Gregorian calendar um, was meant to coincide with the birth of Christ. And we actually do know that the Monks who initially tried to set that date didn't have all the right information at their hands, and they were actually off by mm -hmm. several decades. You know, they tried to use, for example, the story in the Gospels that um, you know, Jesus was born during the reign of King Herod. However, by the time in our calendar now, year one of the uh, Gregorian calendar, King Herod was dead. So we know that it had to have been earlier. But anyway, that was the idea. The idea of the Gregorian calendar is that it begins with the birth of Christ, so does the long count begin with the creation of the world. Or the cre not the creation of the world so much as the creation of this version of the world. Um, and it's somewhat interesting that it begins on that 13th. 
And there are several different ways that you can look at it, and I'll give you a couple. Um, one way is to think that in their, in their creation stories, there's the idea that there have been previous versions of the world um, with previous, previous versions of humans. Um, the, first, the first version of humans had been made out of mud, but the gods didn't care for them so much, and they ended up washing away in the rain. The uh, second iteration of humans were made of wood, but the gods didn't like them so much and did away with them. And this last iteration, the iteration that we're in, the humans were made of corn. So that's why the birth of the corn god is so important, because that's really the, the birth of this version of humanity. We are corn. And um, so one of the ideas is the reason they write 13 there as the start date is to indicate that the previous creation lasted 13 baktun. And now it starts over again. So you get this idea of previous creation lasting 13 baktun, which is about 5,000 years. It's 5,126 and some change years. I just generally think of it as 13 times 144,000 days. And I don't worry about what that exactly means. <laughs> um, the other way to think about it is that maybe they think of this long count still being cyclical, and you can kind of think of a clock, like the hands on the clock. Um, zero and 12 are actually the same position on the clock, and every time you come around to it, you never actually write it as zero, you write it as 12 on the clock, and that's, I think that's kind of a nice, a, a way to kind of conceive of maybe what the Bakhtun is doing. But there's scant evidence for any of those ideas. Um, one of the important things to know about the Maya culture is how very, very little we know about the Maya culture. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, you know, all of their writings destroyed. Most of their cities have been taken over by the jungle, and archaeologists have just scratched the surface of what there is to find. So there's so little information that we actually know, and I think, you know, in the next hundred years, it'll be fascinating. Archaeologists will look back at uh, what people were saying about the Maya now and kind of snickering, oh boy, they didn't know anything. They, have dis they hadn't discovered this wonderful vault in this unknown city. So here's one of the issues. I told you that no one was using the long count by the time of the Spanish conquest. Um, so how could we correlate the long count to um, the European calendar? No, one, no Maya were using those dates, so any dates that would have been written in historical times for the Spanish would not have an equivalent date in, long, in a long count date. And the trick we, that they end up, uh, scholars end up using is to try to look at the fact that the long count dates are always written with that 260 day and 360 day cycle also. And the Maya of the time, as well as um, most of the other peoples of um, the northern part of Mesoamerica, we're also using some version of that 260-day and 365-day cycle. Mm -hmm. So what they try to do is look at the dates that correlate with historical times in those two calendars, and then run them backward, many, many versions of those cycles, and see if they can make correlations with dates they see uh, in the classic period. And there's actually been over a dozen different correlations that people have come up with. Um, there's one that is kind of the one that most of the archaeology field is kind of conglomerated around. And that, uh, that correlation gives us a start date of August 11th, 3114 BC. So that's the correlation with the Gregorian calendar. 3114 BC was the beginning of that long count. So that means that today's date is 12, 19, 19, 6, 15, and that's the long count date, and then the um, Sulkin is 13 men and 18 wolf. Or the year 2012, month 5, day 10, and it's a Thursday. So that means that there are 225 days left until we hit 13, 0, 0, 0, 0. Again, although note that it won't be the same, uh, it won't be the same sort of updates as the creation, and that's going to be this year, 2012, December the 21st, a Friday. So 
So what does it mean? Does it mean destruction? <laughs> That's what a lot of people will tell you it means. Well, it doesn't really mean, as far as we can tell, it means nothing. Um, there's only one monument that we have found in all of, uh, all of our excavations. And I should say ours, because I'm not an archaeologist. But um, it's this tablet. It's the only one that actually references the coming 13th Bakhtun. All the other ones talk about creation. They don't seem to be very concerned about the future, the next Bakhtun. Or the next 13th Bakhtun, I should say. Um, and kind of the Murphy's Law, if you will, this monument is broken, and so where it actually starts talking about what's going to happen that day, it's unreadable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we don't even really know. There seems to be a little bit of hint about talk of a certain god who's going to get dressed up that day. We don't know what he's going to do that day. There's some scholars who have um, supposed that it's not actually that god who's getting dressed up, but perhaps either a priest or a king who will get dressed up as that god, which was kind of a common thing that would happen in the Maya uh, celebrations, is that you'd have a priest or a king who would dress up as a god to kind of play out and play acts that god's characteristics. So, I mean, that's all we know that the Maya thought about to this date, was that they thought somebody might be impersonating a god, or maybe that god was going to get dressed up. For what reason we don't know, we do know that they saw each of these period endings, each Bakhtun, as kind of a significant, um, a, a significant milestone, if you will. You know how we celebrate you know, decades and centuries and millennia, and we you know, had this giant party in the year 2000. Um, so too did the Maya. And they certainly would think that the 13th Bakhtun is you know, a really great celebration. However, there is nothing to indicate they ever thought it was any kind of ending at all. So, I think it's pretty fair to say that the Maya did not predict the end of the world in 2012. So, again, anyone who says, the Maya predicted the end of the world in 2012, they don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> there's, no, there's, there's nothing written anywhere about it. Yeah, but you just said this, was, this is what they're yeah, this and is what's written in it. And you said it's the same. And it tells us nothing, yeah. Well, I mean, but you've got to understand, this was written 1,200 years ago, this month. Right. And you're saying there's nothing. Now, you could say there's nothing, but this is something. Mm. Uh, so, I mean, to argue nothing, you could say it's <laughs> like something. Well, it's something, yes, but it's, what I'm saying is that there's, there, there isn't any, there, there's no information for us to even glean from that. I mean, there's, okay, there's a teeny bit, but it, it so far as we can understand that information, there's really nothing for us to learn well, at this point from what we have. But it's, but yeah, but to say there's nothing, <coughs> I, I find that alarm, that is, there is something, okay? Yes, it's true, there is something. Is, the period ending events, as you well know, were the occasion for erecting all these stelae, and these are very small period of ending of, uh, events, at the ending of a custom. Mm -hmm. They erected enormous stelae at the end of each custom period, all through their classic period. Now, it certainly seems that they pay a great deal of attention to period ending events. 